Today is Sunday, June 20th, 2021. I will probably put today's slides on there because I have many slides today. And I know I won't get through them all, but the topic is very important. And I was just asked about the science of the saints, what that means. That's what we're trying to teach, some of the science of the saints. I... Dogma is good, and we teach about dogma, we teach about morals, that's all part of the science of the saints. You have to have the foundation and proper conscience, how to understand conscience issues, questions. Especially the young need to be taught well about conscience, what it means, what a sin is, what a sin is not, what a temptation is, how to discern the difference, how to be at peace with oneself, with God, in this way. It's very important very helpful to have that peace. And today, the science of the saints is very important, especially today, because it's hard to live in this world and to be part of the world, which we are physically part of the world. But today, more than ever, we can't be of the world. It's just, you just can't. You've got to change a little bit. And be more reserved in the sense about your participation in things that go on because the science of God to live it properly, to live it well, to live the interior life, to live for God, it takes a lot of thought, a lot of concentration, silence as the my imitation of Christ, my book, my imitation of Christ talks about silence, one of the early chapters and the first book, very beautiful, about silence and being able to speak with God. And God does not speak with souls, except in silence. God does not come usually amongst the crowd until a soul like St. Benedict Joseph Labre, as you know, I've talked about him a little. He was in the world, in a manner of speaking, would go around to the churches in Rome, would walk to many of the shrines of Europe, especially in the first years that he was a, a pilgrim. And in this time, he was there, but he kept to himself. And that's why the beautiful pictures of him, when you see a picture, he's the ones I've seen, always looking down, his eyes cast down on the ground, so that he wouldn't be disturbed by the things of the world, distracted. Why? I firmly believe because he had reached divine contemplation and probably divine union. And so God was always with him in that unique way that the saints talk about, that the spiritual writers talk about, St. John of the Cross especially, about how when a soul reaches the first stages of mystical prayer, that God comes and makes his presence felt in a way that they can't explain. But God tells them, I'm here, and all is well. But to distract oneself of the, by the things of the world, unnecessary things especially, frivolous things, this, that type of level of holiness, and it's a great level of holiness. As I mentioned, Father Arantaro prayed for it for a long time, understood it through the confessions of the sisters who had reached these stages, it appears. And he complained five years before the end of his life that he had never once tasted mystical prayer. We don't know why. But God doesn't come in those ways. That is our vocation to reach. This is our vocation. And this is what all my slides and all my presentation today is about a couple gospel stories about this and the things that we need to do to reach it. So to be in the world is one thing. And as I told you, some souls leave the world. But I can tell you from reading I have done recently about 
some religious. Most of them, and this was years ago, very sad to see that they really didn't truly enter into the religious life. They were in an environment which was religious, yes, but it didn't change their heart. You could see it from the things that they did to another sister, the way they treated her. It was very unfortunate. And these are the good old days. But that's why I say, do you need to leave the world to live a good religious life that God wants you to lead? Yes, you must. Not physically necessarily, but interiorly, spiritually. You must detach yourself from the world. You will get nowhere if you don't detach your heart. That's what purity of, purity of heart is all about. It's a very important, one of the first things of part of the purgative state, the purgative life that we are supposed to traverse if we are going to reach to God is the purgative way, the aesthetical. It's all related to the aesthetical life. And that purgative way is very important. And to concentrate, one of the things that they say to concentrate on is purity of heart, purity of mind, purity of intention, the purity of soul. I believe there's a beatitude about that. The beatitudes are very interesting and I wanted to touch on them a little bit related to the subject that we are going to go over. Especially blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I believe the one is blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now these these beatitudes are not only for the blessed in heaven. In other words, after you die, that you are blessed in this way. It's also in this life. Happy are those who suffer persecution. So, as I said, I will do my best to try to give you some of my thoughts. It's very difficult. I'm, I'm finding difficulty in doing it as I should. I, somebody else would be able to probably do it far better than I can. I know that, and I feel that I'm understaffed here. Now, there are a couple of things that I wanted to relate and it is kind of taking off or continuing. Unfortunately, you might think I'm beating the dead horse, but I'm not. Because this, to me, summed up a lot about what we've been talking about in terms of sin and our conversion, a true conversion of life. Last week I talked a lot about contrition. Contrition. What does that mean? How must the soul be contrite, sorrowful for what we have done? And if you look at what our Lord says in the Gospel about this, it will help, I think, to understand a little deeper what I want to say. Now there went out with him great multitudes, and he turned and said to them, if any man cometh unto me and hateth not his own father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, he in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. That's where I said some of these things seem a little strange for us to comprehend. But the way the, the, the writers put this particular aspect, which is not what I wanted to concentrate on so much, but it is interesting. Our Lord says this, but why does he put it this way? And it, the understanding is is that our Lord states it this way because the love and the greatness, the infinite dignity of God, who has called us and created us for the one calling of sanctity and union with him in heaven, which is completely, absolutely incomprehensible, then because God is so infinitely above everything, above our own self, because be above everything that we have in this world, anything in this world is like if it was dung to St. Paul, as he says, I count all things as dung for the greater knowledge and love of Christ. If that's the way it is for St. Paul, who has reached the high level of divine union, because as you know, he was wrapped up, he says, to the third heaven. 
We don't quite know what that means. But he was wrapped up in high prayer with God, union with God. And, and he calls these things dung. What must God look upon these things as? If people, when they traverse this path, as St. Francis of Assisi did, and he learned poverty, absolute dire poverty, when people would give him money, it said in his biography about him, he'd sometimes take it and just throw it away on the street because he had no use for it. God will supply what I need to eat. God will supply. Now, I'm not saying that's us, but he's unique. He's just a unique saint that is very difficult to understand and comprehend the depths of the life that God led him to, the example that he wanted to give us. But God is so infinitely above all the things that are of the earth. And these things, as he created them, are for our wonder, for our understanding of God's greatness. They're just a faint hint of it. All the beauties of the universe are just a faint hint of the beauty of God. It's infinite. And so God, when he compares what our love should be for him, he sees it and he expresses it because it's the only way maybe to express it properly, that we must hate, relatively speaking. It's not really hate. We just, our love for these creatures is, in itself, is good and worthy and needs to be there, obviously. And that's how they explain it. It is there. But our love for God must be everything. And nothing can get in the way of our love for God. That's where duty is the best way to make sure that we are doing what God wants. Follow what he has commanded. And he will give you the grace to follow and to do what's necessary. But the important thing here was, the second half, for which of you desiring to build a tower doth not first sit down and count the cost, whether he have where with to complete it, lest happily when he hath laid a foundation, is not able to finish all that behold him, begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, as he goeth to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and take counsel, whether he is able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is a, yet a great way off, he sendeth an embassy and asketh conditions of peace. So therefore, whosoever he be of you that renounceth not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. Now, the middle part is what I find to be so pertinent. And I don't know about you, but I've heard this gospel for more years than I want to admit. And it doesn't penetrate much for most of that until you really start to think about it, pray over it. Read on it. What does this mean? Well, I'm not a king. Maybe this was for King Louis, who had a fight, and they entered the, the crusade. So they had to figure out how to fight the people in the crusades with the few men compared to the many that the enemy had. But no, that's not the point. The point is very pertinent for us, for each of us. And it has to do, it has to do with, and the way, I should say, the way I want to express it and to impress upon you the importance of this has to do with what we are talking about, sin. And when a person, and I'm not talking about anyone here, obviously, as you know, but just in general, when people sin, when I sin, and I've sinned my whole life, we are sinners, we're a fallen race, and the objective is to overcome that, yes. Even the great saints, though, St. Margaret Mary, it's over, overwhelming almost, the way she calls herself a sinner, and all her faults, and all her difficulties. 
and you think of the little foibles she had, just little distrust in the Sacred Heart. Like the Sacred Heart, when she lost Father Colombrier, if I pronounced it right, when she lost him as her confessor, because, I don't know if it was the Pope, asked him to go to fight some of the errors in the North, so he left. And she complained to our Lord, and he got after her. How dare you complain? Am I not everything you need to take care of you, to direct you? Our Lord was appearing to her and helping her and obviously sometimes scolding her, which she took very much to heart. So what the point of this gospel passage, the way I want to express it, is to think about sin and think about maybe your own Venial sins, for example. And what do I do? I know for myself, as I was growing up and getting to this point, what did I do? I'd go to confession. I would examine my conscience, as I was supposed to. I would say an act of contrition, pray to the Blessed Mother before confession to help, and the Holy Ghost to help to understand your sins. Go to confession and do my penance. And that was it. That was the extent of it, for the most part, until I got to the point where starting to practice mental prayer. And this is one of the big things about mental prayer, especially at the beginning of mental prayer, is to help to not only when we confess our sins, but now we look upon, for example, this passage of our Lord and he's explaining about this king who had to go against another king what does he do he sits down and thinks how am I going to conquer in this battle what must I do and that's you and I in the interior life in the spiritual life this is what this is related to this is about Sin, which is the first part of the interior life, is purging ourselves. The purgative way. Purging ourselves of the attachments, not only to the world, but the things that pull us from God. Sin. And faults of ours, which keep us from God. So now i got to do something. I have to set up a plan. I have to be that warrior. We've talked about that before. We must be not just soldiers in this battle. Not just a soldier. You must be the captain of the army. It might only be an army of one. But you are the captain and the soldier. You have to be able to think. Where am I? That's the first thing we do. Where am I in my interior life? Do I have one? Is it strong? Is it the first thing I think of when I rise in the morning? Is it the last thing I think of when I go to bed? Is this the heart of my life? The science of the saints. As the saints say, it's the science of the saints, you could put it another way, as they always mention, the spiritual writers, the one thing necessary. Only one thing. That's the science. The science of the saints is to how to reach that one thing necessary. And what is that? It is the heart of Christ. It is to become one with Christ. And all these authors have talked about this one science is the most difficult. It's the most difficult. And I can tell you, when I try to do the little that I can, it's almost frightening sometimes. Somebody kind of laughs at me a little bit when I explain that. I think I said something that might not be exactly right or may give a misunderstanding because I'm I'm not the expert that it would be nice to be to be able to explain this stuff well. But I do my best. So in the spiritual order, he says here, No one is advised not to undertake the enterprise, but everyone is exhorted to weigh the nature of the undertaking. So when thou comest to the service of God and stand in fear, 
and prepare thy soul for temptation. That comes from the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes. If no thought is bestowed on the labor to be done, preparation is not made. The opposing agencies surprise an unprepared antagonist and easily overcome him. I've heard of things like this. It was uncanny, some of the stuff I've heard over the years, about how people, they don't understand how all they all of a sudden got into, what do they call the perfect storm. The perfect storm showed up, and everything came together like against them, without them kind of even knowing it. And that's kind of understandable. That can happen if we're not prepared, if our life is not concentrated, and we are not trying to live the full science of the saints, the interior life. If it's not our in a sense, our main business of life. In the 33rd verse, in the second one here, he says, Jesus demands as a condition of discipleship that a man renounce all that he has. This follows naturally from the nature of God and from our relations to him. He is not one of many gods, but the one only true God from whom we have received everything. He loves us and has asked for our love in return. And our love of him should be proportionate to what he is to us. So, that puts in, helps us to put in perspective the words of our Lord about you must hate your own self in proportion to your love of me. From this point, the scale rises as men give less to this world and more to God. It reaches its highest degree of excellence in the man who actually gives up everything and takes the Lord for his portion. It is our duty, therefore, to struggle up to as high a point as possible in that scale of excellence. Now, obviously, he's first of all pointing out in this part that those who left the world physically. But don't think of it that way solely. Understand it from the point of view, you too should, in a unique way, because you are in the world, to live as if you're not in the world. As St. Paul says, put on the new man. So, just because people are in a monastery doesn't mean that they are working to become a saint. And just because we're in the world does not give us an excuse not to see our first and foremost objective of life as to become a saint. And now, this is where I actually started yesterday with my preparation, was more with this passage. It, this was from St. Matthew's Gospel. And the, the only part that I really want to talk about is at the end. But at that season, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou didst hide these things from the wise and understanding, and didst reveal them unto babes. Let us hope that we are those babes. And it's through our prayer that you become like that, that he will reveal these things. That's why we often read the Gospels. And they don't penetrate. And then one day, if you have a good heart and prayerful heart, and you have struggled to find God, after struggling the purgative way, then God sometimes starts to reveal what the true meaning and the depths of the things are that he explained to us. Father, for so it is, was well pleasing in thy sight. And the most important, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon thee and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So, I want to encourage you to think about these words as well in relation to our life of conversion and the purgative way towards a deep interior life, the purgative part. The overcoming of any obstacles of sin, for example. 
I know I talked about recidivism and all that, and I last week tried to explain a little better what I meant by that and what it really means. doesn't mean that anyone who commits the same sin more than once is a recidivist, as I mentioned. No, it doesn't. And I'm not trying to scare that theory into you. It's not true. We are fallen. And God understands that. However, these passages, these two passages are pertinent to that overcoming anything that we have that we realize, you know, I committed the same sin six months ago, a year ago. And a year before that, I committed the same, I confessed it, and a year before that. That's how the spiritual writers talk about it and try to explain. When that happens, then we need to sit and now take a full ordering of our life and to see what do I have to do to go up and to fight and conquer this king who is coming against me. You are fighting for kingdom. And that's literally true. Our Lord said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. It is a kingdom. It is God's kingdom. And he is enthroned there. If you're in the state of grace, he is enthroned there. As St. Teresa of Avila points out, there are many mansions in your soul. And God showed it to her in a vision. Mansion of crystal. And God dwelt in the center one. And it is through the purgative way to start with that we get into the first mansion and we start to understand more deeply. So you are a kingdom. Your soul is God's kingdom. And so you must look at it as a king. Do you think he express these things in in this point where he's talked about the king going up against another king? That he had in mind the fact that your soul is a kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is within you. And you must fight for it. And so you must take thought on what is it? What are the temptations? What are the occasions that lead me even into something very simple? A fault of ours. A lack of trust in God. That's very difficult to overcome. Especially when you're so in this, for some of us, for me, when everything is going well on the external order because of my hard work and my labor and things I have done and things I have accomplished and things I do for other people and I feel so good about myself. And then I realize it's not because of me. It's the grace of God. How to overcome this fault of feeling complacent. Feeling that it's in my hands. I can conquer these things. And I overlook the gift of God. So how do I conquer this fault of mine? I have to think and penetrate the reasons for it. As I pointed out here, there's no no overcoming of a vice without a positive examination and determination. So, in other words, what I'm saying is, we go to confession. I know for myself, I'd go to confession for years. But I didn't have any positive activity I was doing, analyzing my state. Why was I falling into this or that sin? To make... A plan that how am I going to conquer this king that's coming against me? Where do I have to send my soldiers? What weapons will I use? What defenses? What walls do I have to build so that when he gets here, he cannot enter my kingdom without a great fight? What must I do? And so it's until we come to the understanding, I must have a plan I must do something to conquer this. You will not conquer without a fight. God wants us to fight. And this is very important for some, obviously. If grave fault, others, if we commit grave faults, then the examination, the determination, and the fight must be very, very great in proportion to the gravity of the fault. In light matters, venial sins and for faults, 
then our determination, our fight, and examination do not necessarily need to be, need, that's the word I want to use, need to be as strong. But if we take no, I should say, if we make no positive effort to overcome them, are we going to conquer them? Is it going to be possible for me to conquer the enemies that are within me if I don't make a plan as our Lord was trying to express it. Let me start at the beginning. The invitation is extended to all men who, for who is there that does not labor and is not heavily laden? The true description of man's life is given by Job. Man that is born of woman is of a few days and full of troubles. Hence the Savior's words are a message of comfort and peace to a suffering world. It says to every man that in the darkest sorrow, in the most hopeless grief, there is a certain source of rest and happiness in Christ. Now these words are as absolutely true as that God exists. This promise cannot fail. And yet men suffer and they cry out to God. And full off no visible help comes. Men through long waiting grow sick in despair. Yeah, and kill themselves in a wild attempt to escape misery. And where is the promise of Christ? To answer this question, we must first declare that Christ has not promised to give us rest in our foolish way, but in his own infinitely wise way. Christ looks upon man's two existences in a different light than that in which we view them. Now Christ fulfills his promise always and with bountiful measure, but in the higher order. That higher order to him was more real than the present order is to us. Hence, the present promise primarily regards the soul's life and eternity. But, now this is basically, and I only have a few minutes left, and it's so disheartening because I don't have the time to go into this in the detail that I'd like. This next part is very important. It does not thereby follow that the rest promised by Christ comes not in this life. It is a present effect, but consists in such an action of Christ in the soul of the believer that temporal, temporal suffering is transformed into joy and crosses become light by Christ's presence and his love. This is the never-failing rest and comfort that is given to every believer who comes to Christ. Of course, the perfect rest is only given in heaven, but a certain participation of rest and happiness is given here. Now, the point, I see this based upon things that I have studied and read, and many of them over and over, from the, some of the greatest spiritual writers. From reading the lives of the saints, you get the inkling of this. I think he overemphasizes, just like our Lord in the, in the, in the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the pure in, in heart, for they shall possess God. These are blessings that are not just for heaven. These are unique, especially for the one that says, Blessed are the meek, for you shall possess the land, the earth. And in a way they do. The meek do. They draw people to them. People like to be around a meek person. You find the opposite, and it's repulsive. You know what I mean. It's very difficult to be around a person that is not meek, who is the opposite. But my point is here, it is through this purging, through the purgative way, through the purging of sin, the determination and this effort that we need to take, this is what I want to point out to you, is don't go through and think that just because I say my prayers, because I stay out of sin as best I can, I stay away from the things of the world, I avoid all these things that even good Catholics are getting themselves involved in because it's normal. That's what they'll say. It's the normal thing today. You have to have... You're kind of abnormal if you don't have this, this, and this. Is that not right? As I talked to somebody yesterday, we should all go back to one phone on the wall that hangs up and has a cord. Get rid of everything else. The world would be much better off. 
First of all, parents would know what the kids are talking about to their friends. End of that. I don't want to go into that too much. But the point is that what I am trying to impress upon you is that, and I want you to understand, that this promise of Christ, as he says, is primarily for heaven. Yes, but it starts very definitively, very positively, very greatly in this world as well. If you pursue the interior life, if you do a true purging, if you try to find the depths of the malice that is in you, even though it's very small, so even small things can keep us from God. Now, God will, at the end, when we purge ourselves of venial sin, for example, and the attachments we have for it, and we then have our faults to conquer, you will never likely overcome them all. God will not let you, in a manner of speaking. First of all, because when you conquer the first faults that are the worst, the littler ones start looking enormous. They look worse than the other ones. And so you get, i got to conquer that too. Why? Because Christ wants you to be humble. He wants to fe- have you feel. And if you don't believe me, read the book on St. Margaret Mary. He appeared to her all the time, was strengthening, helping her, guiding her, protecting her. And yet she had all these faults that he'd come and correct her on. Her guardian angel would correct her. And she would love to run to the Sacred Heart and tell her, tell the Sacred Heart, I'm sorry. And the Sacred Heart loves that. He loves a repentant heart. Especially for faults and little things. But this, this gift of God, this gift of what he says here, since I'm not getting to the end, Take my yoke upon thee and learn of me, for I am meek and humble, and ye shall find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. All of that will become true for you as you purge, as you take the interior life and the science of the saints to heart, as I know you are. But I am encouraging you to think again more deeply. How can I purge myself even more? To separate myself from the things that will pull me, not so much pull me, but prevent me from coming to God in the way that God wants to draw my soul. Because I can tell you, I know through my reading, my study, my working with people, observing people, observing my own weakness, that there are things that God abhors, that most of us overlook. And that first thing that I said This explains a lot. If you don't hate your own self, you cannot be my disciple. In other words, you are not going to be an intimate lover and intimately loved by God in the way he wants to lead you to the interior, to him who lives in the interior of your soul. He is in that kingdom. He wants you to come and find him. But you must purge. You must get rid of those things that are holding you. And I don't have time to explain those little things in detail right now. I wish I did. But maybe God's stopping me for a reason. Take this to heart. If you do and you start to understand it more deeply, pray to the Holy Ghost that he guide you and help you and you will someday understand exactly what I mean. And what I'm trying to say. Because I didn't explain it as well as I should. Maybe you understand it today. Hopefully God will help you. So thank you for coming. I hope to see you again. You're welcome.